Kim Owens. And I'm Lexi Katz, and welcome to The Transcript. This week, The Transcript breaks down standards-based grading, explores Mike's maze, and checks out the football team. This week, California Governor Gavin Newsom has announced plans to require eligible students to get vaccinated against COVID-19, making his state the first in the U.S. to unveil such a mandate. This mandate, however, only has the possibility of coming into play once it is fully FDA approved for ages 15 and under, while it is only FDA approved for ages 16 and over as of now. The mandate will go into effect for eligible students during the term following the full FDA approval of the vaccine, and there will be exemptions for medical reasons and for personal and religious beliefs. State officials expect the mandate to begin taking effect next fall. During a news conference, Newsom said the COVID-19 vaccine would be added to the state's well-established list of 10 vaccines mandated for students in order to attend in-person school. Over the past two weeks, almost one and a half million people attended the Big E despite concerns over the pandemic. Last year, the Big E was canceled due to the virus, but this year, attendance records have been broken. Large numbers and crowds went to see Machine Gun Kelly, the Goo Goo Dolls, and Styx performances. As face masks were not required, many people assumed the virus would keep people away, but after last year's cancellation, people from all over the world went to see the largest agricultural fair in New England. People wanted to make sure they wouldn't miss out on the food, rides, and buildings the Big E had to offer. On Monday, October 4th, at 11.40 a.m., Facebook users began reporting nationwide outages. These outages also affected the rest of Facebook's apps, like Messenger, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Within minutes, Facebook's routers were inaccessible to users, leaving billions around the world unable to communicate to loved ones or use their services. The company's vice president of infrastructure, Santosh Janardin, claimed these outages were due to engineers making configuration changes on their backbone routers. After six hours, the services came back online, and Mike Schroepfer, Facebook's chief of technology officer, issued an apology on Twitter. He stated, sincere apologies to everyone impacted by the outages of Facebook-powered services right now. We are experiencing networking issues, and teams are working as fast as possible to debug and restore as fast as possible. I'm Max Gladhill, and welcome to Hamp. <laughs> Welcome to Hamped Up. <laughs> Y'all ready for this? Friday Night Football is finally back at NHS after a two-year hiatus due to COVID-19. This week, the Blue Devils faced off against the West Side Terriers in a showdown bringing out fans from both cities to the stadium. We put on our finest neon outfits and dropped in to see how those in attendance felt about being back after so long. We sat down with team captain Trevor Mislowski for further insight on how it is to be back. Uh, as a captain, I'm responsible for keeping the team in check, making sure all their grades are good and that they show up to practice every day and don't skip. Uh, well, last year we had a lot less kids because it was during uh, basketball season, so we, lot, we gained a lot of kids this year. We had to wear masks at all times, which is very hard when you're all sweaty because it just gets wet and makes it very hard to breathe, but this year it's made pretty much normal. As a player, it feels very good to have the crowds back because it adds a lot of energy to the game and motivates you to play better and win the game. Were you concerned about the crowds at the games, or do you think others were? I think um, others were. I wasn't uh, concerned. Uh, I think we've done good with COVID. I think if you wanted to be safe, you could be safe. But I think it was just, just having a fun time. I don't think anyone was really not being safe about it. At last Friday's game, how did the energy match up to games before COVID? Um, it didn't match up at all. Um, I guess it's kind of uncomparable because the energy was a lot higher before COVID and um, it was just overall better. Like people wanted to be there more. Yeah, this year it's just kind of like dead. Like the vibes are dead. <laughs> Step it up, <laughs> NHS. Thanks for watching. Tune in next week to see our segment on NHS soccer. Hi, I'm Levi Armstrong. You might be asking yourself, why am I on a horse? And I'll tell you why. Because we're here at Mike's Maze, the famous corn maze in Sunderland, Massachusetts, where former uh, mazes have included Vote, Alice in Sunderland, and this year the theme is Imagine, marking the 50th anniversary of John Lennon's famous song, Imagine. We came here to, to interview participants and get the lowdown on what the vibe is this year. This is cool. What's this horse's name? This is Pepe. Pepe? How old is Pepe? Pepe is about 15, 16 years old. What is the average lifespan of a horse? Um, they can live into their 30s. Their 30s? Yep. Wow. 
What has your experience at Mike's Bay been like for you so far? Because this is your first time, right? Yeah, this is my first time here. Um, I've been waiting to come here since I moved to the Springfield area, but it wasn't open until like, well, this time of year. And I'm really excited to be here. We just came out of the maze and you know, we were trying to do it without the map for a little bit, but then we got like majorly lost. So uh, it's nice that they give you a map to show you the way around. And we had a lot of fun answering all the trivia questions. And then we had so much fun petting the cute animals over there. So it's really nice. Yes, herrings can fart. Okay, we get it, thanks. What has been your favorite, um, you know, maze design since you've been working here? Or, you know, as much as, as far as you know? Uh, the Woodstock year. That was really cool. I liked that design. It had Jimi Hendrix, whom I love. Cool. Yeah. Do you guys think you're going to make it out of here alive? Yeah. Yes. Definitely. Are you confident in your parents that they're doing a good job? No. No? Why? Because that, they're very bad, and me and Oliver and Dylan have been finding a billion of questions, and they're just like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Woo! Oh, oh, God, my butt. Wow. Woo! <laughs> oh, there's a funeral happening. Oh, my God. I'm getting the I'm getting the there is a funeral. There's a microphone. There's a microphone. There was a funeral happening and we have to leave. Mike's Maze is open till November 7th and tickets are only $14 for students. Have a great long weekend. Over the past year, students and teachers have had mixed reactions to the adjustments to the new grading system, standard-based grading. Standard-based grading is a technique in education that helps students focus more on the learning process rather than their overall grade. It breaks down a grade into different targets that Students get assessed on based on how well they know the individual concept. At NHS, different methods have been used by various teachers and many students report on being confused by the wide range of approaches. We sat down with Megan Harrison, the associate principal at NHS, to hear her thoughts on the matter. We also spoke with various students about their experience with standard-based grading to get a better understanding of the system as a whole. I think that standard-based grading is really smart in theory, but after such a hard year with the pandemic, it makes it so that kids are having to do even more adjusting back into in-person school. And having stuff like formative assessments is really smart and makes it easier for the students, but just adjusting to a new way of life with this new standards-based grading makes it hard. I like standard-based grading a lot. The one thing is I feel like some of the teachers like use different rubrics, or at least they did like at the end of last year. Um, I think if the rubric was the same for everybody, it would be good. But I also feel like it's like not linear, like, you know, like there's 195, 72. I think it would just be a lot better and like a lot less confusing if it was a linear scale. Standard-based grading has affected me by giving me the opportunity to get full credit for my work through reassessment. And personally, I really like that. Uh, because it means that if I don't get it on the first try, I'm able to put in the work and get the credit I deserve. So, personally, it's good. So, I think the easiest way to explain standards-based grading is that it's mastery-based grading. It's a system that evaluates students' progress towards mastering specific learning targets, also known as standards. Students are scored on a range of proficient to exemplary depending upon where they are in that proficiency level. So I think that there's definitely been a learning curve, just like there is for anything when you start something new and progressive, right? So we've been switching both to standards-based grading and to a new grading platform that's Otis. I think that our teachers and students are doing an awesome job acclimating, and I appreciate like all of the work that everyone's been putting into it, and I think we're doing a great job moving on to the new system. With the decaying average, now removed from the system, students are able to reassess and improve without being held back by their previous grade. Thanks so much for watching. See you next week.
thanks so much for watching. Next week is Booster Week, so make sure to dress up with your school spirit and check in with your class officers to find out the themes. Also, make sure to check out guidance and see your class windows. Mm -hmm.